Hey guys, my name is Ali El Karagouli. I am a systems engineer and a postdoctoral fellow at the NASA Jet Propulsion Lab. In this video, I'm going to explain to you telecommunication systems, why they are very, very underrated, and I'm going to explain to you how they work, how, how the ins and outs of telecommunications, what you need to know if you want to become a telecommunications engineer, um, more importantly, whether this thing is even for you or not, and whether this is the right career path for you or not. And the way I'm going to do it is I'm going to first explain what telecom even is. We're going to define it. We're going to give some examples. I'm going to tell you some stories of some projects that I have worked on relating to telecom. Uh, and then I'm going to tell you towards the end why this is a really badass and underrated major. Even if you're someone who doesn't plan on actually be becoming a telecommunications engineer uh, or an, even an engineer uh, in general. So I'm going to start by explaining this diagram that I have over here, which is I have a satellite over here that's talking to some ground station. So you've probably seen these kind of dish uh, antenna ground stations you probably see them everywhere uh, they're used for like uh, I don't know TV they're used for, for for a lot of different services so in this case what we have is we have a satellite and these are electromagnetic waves basically that are being transmitted hence this is called this is TX which stands for transmitter this is RX which is receiver and basically the satellite is trying to talk to the um, ground station antenna and sending these waves and now you, you, you if, if this is in space and this is on the ground, let's say, I don't know, the orbit is like ISS orbit, which is like, let's say, I don't know, 400 kilometers. So at a distance of 400 kilometers, this is a very far distance for the waves to travel, right? And hence, this is where the definition of telecommunications comes from. The telecommunications is telecommunications. The tele means far away, like long distance. The communication means basically the process of sending information and, and communicating. So. This is basically um, a satellite example, but you could also think of this the same as with wireless cell phones or with any type of, uh, like, I don't know, walkie-talkies, any type of radio, any type of uh, device that is sending information over a distance, right? That's basically what it boils down to. Now, what you may notice here is that there's, um, there's three different things that need to happen in order for you to establish a good telecommunications link. Uh, first, you need, to, you need something to transmit, right? You need something to receive and you need to like send something in between, right? So there's the transmitter, there's the receiver, and then there's the actual waves, which carry the signal in this case. This is an electromagnetic uh, telecommunication system. So once you have these things defined, now you may also think of it as software, hardware, and physics, right? So in order for this CubeSat to transmit something to this ground station, uh, it needs to know what to transmit, right? And that starts with like ones, and zeros, right? Like that's the, basically the message. Or like, let's say the message is like, hello, which you break down w using whatever key you want to use to ones and zeros. Then these ones and zeros are translated to waveforms. And then these waveforms are fed into the electronics. And these electronics are basically um, transmitting these waveforms into actual waves. Then here they get picked up by this antenna. This is basically just a reflector. Usually there's some type of horn feed over here. So the waves reflect to the horn feed in this case and then over here is where like your actual electronics are for the receiver and based on that then you're able to go backwards and then you're able to decode the waveforms from the electromagnetic waves and then from that you get the ones and zeros and then from that you're able to get your message which is the hello again right so that's pretty much the the main concept within at any telecommunication systems or communication system in general is that you're basically just trying to send a message um, which starts the software then it becomes hardware and then it goes into the the the, the channel or the uh, air or space or wherever or I don't know the cable or whatever it is they're communicating through uh, and 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 that happens in the form of waves usually so now what I want to go ahead and do is tell you a little bit more about these steps and why I think they are very, very cool. I'm just going to erase this very quickly. So we're going to draw this exact same diagram. We're going to draw it a little bit differently. So you know how we had the scenario of the satellite talking to the ground station. I want you to remember the, that image. Keep it in mind. That's fine. But now we're going to look at it different. We're going to start looking at it like this. Like let's say we have three blocks over here. And let's call this like entire thing the transmitter, or again the TX. Um, and then after that, this guy is gonna communicate over here, and we have three more blocks. 
and we're going to call these three blocks the receiver. Okay. So every communication system or most communication systems follow this configuration. And then obviously here, we're going to describe what is happening. So first, when I'm starting with, uh, I don't know, let's say uh, like a word, like hello, for example, you know, um, there are three steps that needs to take place before I go ahead and transmit my message or send it through the air or through the waves or through whatever it is that I'm trying to do. First, there's something called a channel. Oh, first, there's something called a source encoder. So encoding at the source. Then there's something called, let's say, a channel encoder. And there are different names to describe this. I'm going to give you the, defi the definition of what's actually happening. So don't worry about memorizing the name. Try to actually understand the concept that's happening. And then let's say this is the modulator. I'm going to just call it mod. There's going to be dmod, channel, deencode, and then this is like source, deencode. OK? Now, this is a very classic configuration of communication systems. If you crack open most communication system textbooks, uh, this is basically what it's going to look like. Where basically all you're doing here at the source encoding, uh, you're basically trying to compress. You're trying to make the data efficient. For example, this hello over here, instead of spelling it as like H-E-L-L-O, uh, you're just going to compress it to like H-L-O, right? Now, obviously, you're not doing that in the actual uh, letters. You're doing that with ones and zeros. So here you've, you've already broken down the hello into ones and zeros. And then based on that, you're able to compress it um, not based on like the letter, usually based on the ones and zeros patterns as well. For example, if you have a pattern that goes like, I don't know, 100, 100, 100, you're able to compress that down using only like, I don't know, maybe three binary digits or whatnot. You're able to just get rid of fluff. Now what that does is quite nice because it makes you be able to say what you're trying to say uh, using less uh, digits, which is very good for, for the stuff that's going to happen. Humans do this as well. That's why we are like, instead of saying, I don't know, Probably some people spell it as like probably or like instead of saying um, how about you we like type HBU That's basically what we're doing. We're encoding at the source. We're trying to compress the, the thing that we're trying to do But that only works if the decoder knows what that code looks like So for example, if you text someone you, this probably happened to you or if you try to text someone um, like with an acronym or with a with with something that they don't understand like let's say HBU how about you and they don't understand it they'll be like what oh that's because they don't have the 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 source uh, encoder key right so everything that you're doing here has to be designed symmetrically such that on the receiver side we know exactly what's happening here especially at least with the step one which is the source encoding now once you do this step properly which is okay we've taken what you're trying to say um, and this is all still software territory, by the way. Um, and OK, so now we, we have one zeros. We have them efficient. Um, in this case, the channel encoding is this is where you're trying to, you're actually going to go and add redundant bits. Um, and you're trying to make the, 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 sig the, the ones and zeros more robust. What I mean by that is in an ideal world where you're just transmitting in a perfect channel or in a perfect environment, um, you, you would actually stop here. And you would skip immediately to just modulating your signal. But the world is not ideal. If you're transmitting, for example, from our satellite uh, to ground station, uh, you, you are going to run into air. You're going to run into molecules. You're going to run into other waves like interference. Uh, there's going to be, you're, you're going to just from spreading losses, just from the fact that the transmitter and receiver are so far from each other, uh, you're going to like you're going to get a really weak signal at the receiver. And then there's going to be other stronger signals. So the, the world is not ideal. The environment is not ideal. So what do you do? You account for it. And in this case, what you do is you start adding, you start architecting your message in a way that on the receiver, you're able to check on whether there were errors or not. So here is where error control is introduced. And error control is basically you're trying to control the, the errors that happen um, as you transmit something while, while, when you receive it. And if there is an error that happens, you're trying to either detect it or correct it. Now, it's a little bit out of scope. Of this video, I'm not going to go too much into detail. But here, basically, like you can add stuff to the ones and zeros. Let's say maybe for example, like a very simple example is let, like let's say you add a one at the end of every message, and when you're receiving, you're checking if every message ends with a one, and if every and, and if there's one message that ends with a zero, well, you know that there's an error there. You know that that message has like gone through something that changed it, and and then you don't trust it anymore. And then based on how sophisticated your decoder is. 
uh, you may be able to correct it or you may be able to just detect it and be like, oh, nope, that's not good. We need to receive that message again. We need to ditch it. There's a lot of decisions involved. But basically, all you need to know is that here at step two, you're trying to add uh, redundant bits or you're trying to add some protection, some security that on the receiver, when you're, when you're getting that message, you're, 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 you're not freaking out. Now, again, this is software territory. Uh, where things get exciting is this modulation part. Uh, this is hardware territory because now we're here we're still talking about like ones and zeros um, here we start talking about waveforms right so now we've taken our message from ones and zeros and we're able to transform it into a waveform we're able to actually have it be like a sine wave or a cosine or what or, or whatever uh, however however way we want to modulate and usually again I'm not gonna dive too deep but in most communication systems the way modulation works it, modulation just means you're taking a message and you're equipping it on a carrier. Um, usually it looks something like this, where you have a message, which in this case, again, your ones and zeros. You're going to uh, transform that into some waveform. And then over here, you're going to feed it some type of sinusoid that is like very high power. You combine them together, you, you modulate them, which is a convolution in time, uh, multiplication and frequency. And then you're basically able to get your output signal. Okay, so here is actually your final wave slash message that you're trying to send over. So we started out with ones and zeros, we compressed it, we added some fancy things to it, then we converted it into a wave, a waveform, we combined it with another waveform, and then now this is our final waveform. Okay, so now again, you're like, wait, why are we combining them, combining it with this other waveform? Why can't we just um, send the message on its own. Well, usually this thing is, is usually very, very weak. This is closer to baseband. Uh, it's at a very low frequency. In order to transmit things electromagnetically, you need to be at a higher frequency such that things actually can propagate into the air. Um, so there, for physics and electrical engineering reasons, which I'm gonna dive in in future videos, uh, you need this carrier. You need this higher, higher power, higher frequency wave to be able to, to, to carry your message. And the way you can think of this is this is like a school bus and this is like a student and the school bus like the student gets inside the the school bus and the school bus like takes the student somewhere and then the school bus drops the student so the larger of a school bus you have the more seats you have the more students you can fit uh, hence um, this is the analogy for example of um, the higher frequency you have the more bandwidth you have av available meaning you can fit m a bigger message meaning you can have a higher data rate so if you're trying to achieve higher data rates, you want to go higher in frequency generally. Anyway, a little, little bit of a deviation. But once you achieve this waveform over here, which again is amazing, this is like literally just the message that we started out with, then you go through the channel. Then you actually propagate. So at the end of the modulation um, stage, usually there's some type of antenna, right? Like you modulate and okay, cool, now I have a waveform. What do I do with it? Well, you feed it through an antenna and that antenna propagates it into the air. And this is where the channel actually happens. Now, channel is just a fancy word of like, like the space between the transmitter and receiver, right? So in the, in, in the case of the satellite talking to the ground station, the channel is just like the air or the atmosphere or whatever, or like a little bit of space and a little bit of atmosphere. The channel is usually not uniform. If it's a uniform channel, then that's very easy to communicate over. Uh, if it's something that's varying, that can get a little bit tricky. But once we have this waveform, then we feed it through the antenna, and then the antenna propagates it through the air, through electromagnetic waves. So this, it goes from looking like this to something that looks more like fields and waves, like spheres, like spreading into, into, into the air, and you're just like uh, spreading infinitely. Now, depending on whether your antenna is directional or, or, or not directional, the waves can be directed in, an, in, a, in, a, in a certain place, like, uh, like lasers, or for example, like this is why reflectors have this shape because this allows them to focus the energy again we're not going to worry about that but basically once you send that information over then you're going to have the receiver and the first part of the receiver is again some other type of antenna that captures that energy and then you feed it into your demodulator so now we're going to go and do literally the reverse operation which is i mean there's there is usually some steps in between uh, like you want to make sure that the waveform like again some type of kind of like how we did over here where you're adding some redundancy to the ones and zeros there are things you also do on the waveform level 
to make sure when you're receiving it, you're like, I don't know, making it, you're filtering some stuff out, you're, you're amplifying some things, you're doing all that. But once you've done a good enough job and, and brought the wave to look back like this, then you just literally do the same process in reverse, which is like, you demodulate, you extract the message out of that, so you, so you feed it this same carrier, and then you get this waveform back. So now here we get this small waveform, um, and then we convert that waveform into ones and zeros. We check if there are errors or if there's anything that went wrong, and then we recover what the actual message was. And then once we have the message here at the source, then we go and apply the decompression algorithm that is basically the reverse of this guy. And then we go back to getting our hello. So this is in a nutshell how a communication system works. Uh, again, I really, really think it's badass. Now, why I think this is badass, and, and this is the promise I gave you at the beginning of the video, which is, why is this such a cool field? Why is this such an underrated field? Uh, because by definition, a communication system is a system. That it forces you to think about the software, it forces you to think about the hardware, and it forces you to think about the physics, like the propagation physics. And in my case, one thing that has really, really helped me is when I was a junior in college, I, I really got interested in communication systems. I was even the communications lead of a CubeSat project, and I just loved comms. And I had no option but to learn hardware, software, physics. Like it was, if I didn't, I would, I would be a crappy communication system engineer, you know? Obviously you can specialize, you can be like an antenna engineer, you can be an RF engineer, you can be an error control engineer, you can be a network engineer. Like there are sub-specialties within that, but I really think this field is amazing because it forces you to think in systems and it forces you to think of how things interact together and it forces you to understand software, hardware, and physics. And if you're an engineer who understands software, hardware, and physics, man, you are like, you can do anything. You can literally do anything. Uh, you, yeah, you can literally do anything. <laughs> like I'm, I have, I have uh, like, I have many projects I'm working on, some software, some hardware. I have a business I'm running, I have this YouTube channel. Like it just gives you, like once you have a good enough understanding of physics, which is how the world works. And once you understand like how to start building technology that fits into that world, in, in the realm of hardware and in the realm of software, like you, you can do anything. You can do whatever you want, you know? And that's just very, very underrated. So even if you're someone who does not, who ends up pursuing this, I would strongly encourage you to dive deep into getting an understanding of each one of these steps. Uh, because even if you don't end up working as a telecommunications engineer or as a communications engineer, uh, you have transferable skills at the second order inside your brain that you can do whatever you want with especially being able to think in systems and operate in systems. And I made another video on systems engineering and why it's even cooler. So if you enjoyed this video, I think you're gonna like this one even more. Go ahead and watch it. Peace, love.